In this video, we're going to talk about how arrays work in C. In a lot of ways, at least syntactically, arrays are similar in C as what you've seen before in Java. However, there's some really key differences, especially because in C, arrays aren't objects. So in this video, we're just going to introduce C arrays and discuss how they work. We'll have other videos that go in more detail as far as how they work and how they're represented in memory. So to declare an array in C, I give it the type, I give it a variable name, and I'll just call it array, and a size. So this is an array declaration. And actually, it's an integer array declaration. I can also do an initializing array declaration. So I'll say an integer array with four elements, and I'll initialize that with one, two, three, four. Notice the one, two, three, four are in braces. I can also have a double array. And here I'm not going to put sizes. So in this case, B is the size of the initializer. So something you may want to try on your own is ask yourself, what happens if you declare an array with a size smaller than the initializer? But we won't deal with that now, but just something to think about. And in general, you either want to initialize it with the correct size or not give it a size and use an initializer. I can't think of a lot of scenarios in which you want to declare a smaller array, use a larger initializer, because there's no point in having that larger initializer. Now for my array indices when I go through loops, I'm going to create an unsigned int called ii. And we want this to be unsigned because we're never going to access array index negative 1. Some languages let you do that. C doesn't. The reason I use ii for my loop variables is because it's an easy thing to search for. If you just search for i or j or k, those letters come up a lot, especially i. But ii, jj, kk are pretty rare. So if you're searching for those, then they're easier to find. And that can sometimes be helpful. So let's create a loop. We'll go from 0 to 10. And we're going to say array ii is equal to ii times. And we'll just say 100 just so that there's some numbers. So this is going to initialize that array. And then I'm going to print each array's values. And so this, I'll print the index, and I'll print the value. And for now, I'll just put a, a new line here. We'll change this in a moment. So first, I'm going to print ii, and then array ii. Actually, I'm not going to print that just yet. I'm going to save that for, for later. For now, let's just initialize this. So now, when this runs, this is going to take every index of array and fill it with whatever the index is times 100. And notice this is going to go from 0 to 9. It's it's only going to go until i, while well, i is less than 10. And the reason for this is, is that array indices start at 0, just like in Java. So the valid indices in this array are 0 through 9. Okay, so now we're going to print the array. And let's go ahead and compile and make sure that this all runs. So we have some unused variables, but that's okay. And when we run this, you can see it's filled with the correct values. Now, instead of the tab, uh, the new line here, let's put a tab. And instead of array, let's print A and let's print B. Now, B is a floating point, or it's a double. And we'll say point 0.2 there. A is in it, so D is okay. And of course, the indices are always integers, and so we'll have D as our control sequence in the brackets. Let's add two tabs there. And then this last one, we want a, a new line. So this will print this, then this on the same line, then this, and then everything's on the same line, so we should be able to compare. Now you may notice A and B are not 10 indices long. So this is clearly some undefined behavior here. So we let's see what's going to happen here, because we're using some indices that are definitely out of bounds. So when I compile this, no warnings. And then when I run this, 
notice what happens. I get some random values for these. And actually, these aren't random. What's happening is, is that array indexing doesn't really mean give me the sixth index of A. It says give me six indices past the first element. And so this is undefined behavior. What actually happens here is dependent upon the compiler and the system. But usually what will happen is it'll just keep going. It's like, oh, you want six integers past A, the start of A? Sure, no problem. And here's the value. And you can tell that that's definitely not what we would want. And my guess here is that these values are probably related to what's in B, since B is stored immediately after A in memory, most likely. Again, something that depends on the exact system, but that's probably the case here. And just to make that a little neater, let me just do the one tab and see if that fits on one line. Yeah, unfortunately for this last element of B, that's a really, really big number. So even with the just the single tab, it doesn't fit. And of course, keep in mind, the only thing we're doing here correctly is array. The other two, those aren't good. And also, let me add a comment here. Okay, so let me print a blank line here just to get some separation with what's coming next. And now we're going to print some information about the arrays. So I'm going to print the size of the array. And we can use size of and then a variable name or a type to give us that size. And the type returned is a long unsigned integer. So we're going to use LU as our control sequence here. And I'll do the same thing for A and B. So let's compile these and run. I did a print here instead of print F. OK. So let's run this. And you'll notice the size of array is 40, the size of array a is 16 and the size of array B is 24. Now, array is 10, A is 4, and B is 1, 2, 3, is just 3. So you'll notice these numbers aren't what you would expect. So here, let's do this. Let's get the size of an integer and the size of a, a double. And notice, if I divide 40 by 4, the size of an int, I get 10. If I divide 16 by 4, I get 4, which is the size, the number of elements of A. If I divide the size of B, which is 24, by 8, the size of double, that gives me 3, which is the number of elements in B. So this size of function doesn't give you the number of elements. And a common mistake is to put size of in a for loop to determine the end of the array. Well, if you did that here, you can see that all of these would go well past the end of the array. So if you wanted to actually not hard code the size in your for loop, which again is always a good idea. You can do something like this. We'll say ii is equal to zero. ii is less than size of a divided by size of int. And that will tell me how many elements I have. And actually, I'll just use the same line that we had above. Uh, just to be sure we're seeing the right thing, let's change some elements of A. So we'll say A2 is equal to 20, and A3 is equal to 200. And that'll just show us that, in fact, something did change. And let me just add some new lines here. And so now you can see that it printed the four elements of A correctly. I kind of don't like how those are all on one line, though. So let's go ahead and put an in here. And just because we can, let's uh, let's print this out, so, out as a hexadecimal as well. It's always interesting to see that. And it's also good practice to get used to that, because one of the things that's helpful is when you're working with memory and, and with pointers later on in the class, being comfortable working in hexadecimal can, can really be helpful, because it gives you a good insight into what's actually happening in memory. So, and there we go. Oh, that's lowercase, and that kind of bugs me. So I don't want a lowercase x. I want a capital X. And then notice now it prints the hexadecimal A through F as capital letters instead of lowercase.